Good morning. It's good to be here. It's good to see you all on this chilly yet. It's still warm inside and it's not snow, so it's good to be here. Good to have you here today. Uh, welcome. I want to extend a warm welcome of those of you who are maybe watching us online, wherever you're watching. Maybe you're at a place where your church was canceled because of snow or ice. Thanks for joining us today. Um, this morning, we are wrapping up our sermon series on living life together. If you recall real quick, week one, living life together as we gather together around the word. And we talked about living life together as we love one another because Jesus said, all men will know you are my disciples if you love one another. Then we talked about the importance of encouragement and the importance of being generous and giving. Last week, we talked about the importance of actually getting into God's word because if we're going to grow in faith, we have to get into the power source, the very words of God. And today we're going to wrap it up with what I think is one of the most difficult ones, and that's going and actually sharing the good news of Jesus with others. So that's what we're going to do today. Uh, before we begin, just a couple of quick housekeeping things. Whether you're in person or whether you're watching online, you can go uh, to our website and click on the online worship, and that landing page will everything you need. The connection cards, a, a chance to give if you're so moved today. Um, uh, worship guide is there, so anything you might need for worship this morning, whether in person or you're online, you can find it there. So let's begin on this Valentine's Day. What a great opportunity to be here and remember the love of God who gave everything for us. So let's open with our first song. It's called Come People of the Risen King. Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have 
disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father Father in heaven, heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. Friends, God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all of your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God now give you the strength to live according to his will. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for bringing us to worship on this day. Today is Valentine's Day, and what better way to come and think about love as we think about your amazing love for us. A love that moved you to send your one and only son to rescue us from sin and death and the power of of the devil in hell itself. As we get to worship today, as we get to hear these truths and be reminded of that love, help us to take it to heart. Use that message to help us grow in our faith, and then, yes, Father, move our lips to speak of that love and share the good news of Jesus with others. We pray all of this in his name, our Savior's name. Amen. Please be seated. Our first scripture lesson this morning is taken from Peter. If you remember Peter, he was one of those 12 disciples. He was always the one that was quick to speak and say something that oftentimes was kind of dumb. And Jesus had to correct him, yet he was loved by Jesus, he was forgiven by Jesus, and he would go out and proclaim Jesus with many and even give his life for it. And in this section of one of his letters, he reminds us of that truth that we are God's chosen people And not just chosen to come to church for an hour on a Sunday, but actually chosen to be salt and light out in the world. And that's what he reminds us of this morning here in chapter 2. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies crave spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, see, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message which is also what they were destined for. But not you. You, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the word of our God. At this time, I'm going to invite you to please stand. As kind of as our custom every week, we get this opportunity uh, using one of the creeds to confess our Christian faith. And this morning, we're going to do that as we use the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. 
He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Our gospel reading this morning comes from Matthew chapter 28. And if you know how the gospel of Matthew is laid out, these are some of the last words that Matthew records. And they're of an event known as Ascension. Right? Our church is called Ascension Lutheran Church. And on that day, Jesus goes back to heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father after he completed the mission to save us. But before he goes, he gives a command. He gives some marching orders, not just to his disciples then, but to his church in 2021, and this is what he says. We're told that the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and he said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. And make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, I am with you always, to the very end of the age. This is the gospel of Jesus. Please be seated. We now join in our next song. It's called, Preach You the Word. Father, as as we wrap up this sermon series today on maybe one of the most difficult ones of all, sharing you with others, we ask for your help. We ask that you open our ears to hear, open our minds and our hearts to know and to believe and to trust in these truths, and then go from here. Go from here and tell everybody that you have placed in our path the good news, that there's a Savior who loves them who forgives them, who died for them, who saved them. Lord, equip us now to do that as we spend some time in your word. We pray this in Jesus, our Savior's name. Amen. 
This morning, I want to tell you a story about Carl. The first time I saw Carl was shortly after we moved into this beautiful new building. I was sitting there at my desk working on something on the computer, and out of the corner of my eye, I see Carl walking across the parking lot and coming up on the sidewalk, and, and then he disappeared. I didn't think much of it at first. And then 20, 30 minutes later, there he is again, <laughs> carrying his food lion bags in his hand, going back to his apartment. Over the next, I don't know what, six to eight months, I saw Carl probably three to four times a week. There he was, walking across the parking lot. 20, 30 minutes later, he was back walking across the parking lot with his food line bags, and that's just the routine that Carl had. Now, on numerous occasions, I would go out. One time, I, I said, I got to meet this guy. I've seen him like 10 times now. So I go out and I introduce myself. He tells me who he is, and we chit-chat a little bit, and then he goes back to his apartment. I go back to work. Well, this scenario kept playing out over and over and over again, and, and I would see Carl, and, and we'd talk once in a while. Sometimes he'd even stop right there in the parking lot. He'd just look into my window, waving, until I caught a glimpse of him, and then I'd see him, and I'd wave, and I'd go out and talk to him. But all those times that I saw Carl, that I talked to Carl, you know what I didn't do? I didn't even tell Carl about Jesus. Oh, yeah, I, I invited him to church. I said, hey, man, you know, he knew I was the pastor. You should come. We do church on, on Sunday mornings at 9. Uh, in December, I saw him a couple times like, hey, you got to come. You got two, two options on Christmas Eve. I'd love for you to join us. But you know what I never actually did? I never actually opened my mouth and told Carl about Jesus. why right i mean i'm a pastor i'm an over-the-top extrovert i love talking about jesus and so why when god was giving me a, an easy softball to hit right out of the park did i swing and miss like every time again i i love jesus i, I love people one of the reasons i wanted to be a pastor is so that i could spend my life doing that but I didn't tell Carl about Jesus. I failed. And Carl's not the only person in my life that even as a pastor, and most people eventually figure out who I am and what I do, because everybody, you know how, hey, what do you do? What do you do? I'm a Marine. I'm an accountant. I'm a teacher. I'm a pastor. So many times I think about in my life where I didn't tell somebody about Jesus. Well, today... We're going to wrap up this sermon series by talking about what I personally think is the most difficult one of all, sharing Jesus with others. Now, maybe some of you are thinking, wow, that's kind of, that's kind of strange, right? I mean, you're the pastor. We pay you to tell people about Jesus, and you struggle with that? I do. And I'm guessing, in fact, I think I know, <laughs> that many of you, if not all of you, at some level would agree with me. You struggle with that same thing as well. And maybe for different reasons. Maybe, maybe some of you, you're scared, right? If I say something, is it going to hurt a relationship? Is that grown child going to get upset with me if I talk to them about Jesus or the Bible? And so you don't. Maybe some of you are fearful, well, what's the person at the office going to think? What's my classmate going to think? You know, it's just so much easier if I just keep my mouth shut and, and I don't actually say anything. Maybe some of you, you've tried before, and actually something bad like that happened. Or, you know what, you've tried with that family member or friend, and they've never been receptive to it. They've never taken you up on your invitation, so you're like, it's not going to change. So why bother? 
And I would guess that if you're like me, there's some of you out there that are thinking, well, my life is so messed up. I don't have it all figured out. I'm no saint. So who am I to tell that person about Jesus? But you know when we think those things? I think we think that way when we forget the gospel. When we forget that the whole point that Jesus came was to seek and to save and then to send out sinners. In fact, for some of you who maybe think you're too messed up and you're too sinful, I think you just might be the very best missionary God's church has. Right, for those of you who might think, well, I'm not qualified, I don't know enough, my sinful past keeps me out of it, you might be the best person to actually share Jesus with others because you understand God's grace, maybe in a way that some of us forget about it. Because isn't that the point, right? Jesus came to seek and to save sinners. Our, our, our job, our, our goal is not to just come here and give spiritual high fives about how, how Christian we are, but it's to actually go. It's to actually come here and, yes, admit that we are messed up just as much as the next guy, and we need only what Jesus can give. And he gives it. He's forgiven you. He saved you, and now he says, you have to go. <laughs> In fact, it's a command. And it's the last thing Jesus ever said before he went home. Right, we kind of heard a little bit about it in our gospel reading, but there's a reading from the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1 where some of the last things Jesus says to his disciples is giving them their mission. And Acts chapter 1 is really the account of his ascension. They're gathered there on the mountainside. Jesus is giving the marching orders, and then he goes home. And this is what he says to them. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, I think to help us understand where the disciples were when Jesus says this, we, we need to understand the last three years of their life. They had followed Jesus. They had walked with Jesus. They had studied under Jesus. They were led to know and believe that Jesus is the Savior, yet they still struggled. They still had their doubts. Some of them thought, okay, you know, Jesus, he's going to be a political savior where he's going to come in, he's going to crush the Romans, get rid of them, get rid of the nasty religious people, um, bring back the glory days of Israel, and things are going to be great. That's what a lot of them thought Jesus came to do. And so just imagine being them, if that's what you're thinking, then Jesus gets arrested. Then Jesus gets put on trial. Word comes down the grapevine, and you find out they're going to actually kill him the next morning on a cross. And you're thinking, this can't be. Right? He's supposed to destroy the Romans. The Romans aren't supposed to crucify him. But, but there's still hope, right? Because he's not dead yet. But then you, you get word the next day that he's dead. The crucifixion happened. Jesus took his last breath. And he died. And all of your dreams, all of your hopes of thinking that Jesus was going to, to, to make Israel great again and to kick out the Romans, that's dead too. So now what? A couple days later, you start hearing reports that he's not dead. And your gut tells you that it can't be because dead people stay dead. You've, that's just how it works. And, and then you hear more reports. No, no, Jesus is alive. We, we saw him. And then he appears to you and you see him. And hope is renewed. But they're still thinking, okay, 
Now he's alive. Now we're going to go back into Jerusalem. We're going to get the Romans out of here. And we're going to get those nasty Pharisees and the religious leaders that rejected you. And we're going to set up shop. And we're going to have positions in your cabinet. And it's going to be great. And then imagine Jesus <laughs> saying to you this. You ask Jesus, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And Jesus basically says, that's none of your business. He, he really doesn't even answer the question. He says, that's for the Father. That's none of your business. This is your job. You are to go, and you are to be my witnesses. In other words, Jesus says, don't worry about things that you don't know about. Let the Father do his thing, but your job is, now that you have seen and heard the good news of who I am, that I died and I rose for you, you need to go tell people. You need to go share it. You need to tell them that I'm alive and that I died and rose for them. Right? You need to go and share my mission. A mission that's accomplished. And you know that mission, right? You guys know that. Jesus' mission was what? To seek and to save the lost. It was to find those who were unwell, right? What Jesus once said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. And Jesus' point in all of that was actually that means everyone, right? If we could put Jesus into colloquialism, right? Jesus would say, y'all need a doctor. Y'all are sinners. You all need me. And so he came. He came to rescue and to save us. And he did. Now, as you think about that truth, I, I want you to think about this. Do, do you see, do you understand what Jesus is most interested in? It's people. What Jesus is most concerned about are individual souls who are lost. He wants them to know of the power that saves. He wants them to have forgiveness in life and the only place they can find it in him. And he wants us to share that truth. He did that for the disciples. Even when they doubted, even when they, they, they didn't always believe, even though they didn't always trust, even when they didn't always share, he loved them, he was patient with them, he forgave them, and he kept saying, you must go. Right? Notice what Jesus doesn't say. He, he doesn't say, go back to Jerusalem, go build some churches and put my name on it. He doesn't say that. He, he doesn't say, go get your little group and hunker down and keep all the nasty riffraff out. No. He doesn't say, put up your little sign in your shingle and pray that people will come to you. He says, lost people won't come to you. You have to go to them. And so go. Go into Jerusalem. Go into Samaria. Go to the ends of the world. You have to tell them. And that's significant if you think about it, right? I mean, it's easy. Okay, guys, you're going to go back to Jerusalem and Judea, where you're from. Okay, easy day. But now I want you to actually keep going and go to Samaria. Remember the well, the woman at Samaria? Jews and Samaritans hate each other. Are you telling me, Jesus, we're supposed to go to that culture, to those people? Really? Jesus said, yeah. And then I don't want you to stop at the border of Samaria. I want you to keep going, and I want you to go to cultures and people around the globe, and I want you to tell them about me. And that's the same mission that Jesus gives to us. Did you know that there are over 50,000? 50 thousand people in Onslow County here who would say that that they go to a church like if you go and look at all the church records they're on the books 50,000 people in like 140 some churches maybe more and when you look at that number you might be like whoa that's really great that's awesome that's a lot of people in fact I've had people tell me even before we moved here when we first got here Onslow County is very churched 
well, what does that mean? Because here's the deal. Do you know that the last census numbers put Onslow County at about 200,000 people? 200,000 people live in this county. 50,000 are on a church record book. And if we're honest about statistics, you could probably cut that number in half, maybe even more. 50% of people on the books that actually come is being pretty generous in church statistics. So now you're talking like 20,000 people in a county with 200,000 people living in it. And you know what that means, right? It means that a lot of people (laughs) don't know Jesus. It means that an awful lot of people, no matter how church we say Onslow County is, they're not actually regularly going and hearing the good news. That means three out of every four people. I'm not a mathematician, but if it's 20, 25,000 out of even 50,000, I mean, three out of every four people are not connected to Christ. They're not regularly hearing the good news that they have a God who loves them, who died for them, who saved them. And so you know what that means? That means people you work with. Don't assume just because they say they go to a church. I mean, we have people that would say, oh, Sunshine's my church. We haven't seen them in years. Don't assume. Three out of every four, neighbors, family, friends, the parents your kids play soccer with, the next door neighbor that you have barbecues with, there's a good chance that that individual is not hearing about Jesus regularly. And Jesus says, go. Jesus says, tell them. He says, go into the world. And so again, I think we do well to consider, well, what does that mean, go into the world? Now, Jesus is not saying that all of us are going to somehow be missionaries in Africa or Asia or somewhere exotic. So what's he talking about? Because this command is not just for the disciples, it's, it's for us. And so where's our world? Our world is right here. Wherever God has placed you, that is the world into which Jesus says, go. And so this morning, Jesus says to you, go into that world. Jacksonville. Hampstead. Swansboro. Sneeds Ferry. Wherever you're watching online, that's your world. He says, go and tell people. Tell people who know Jesus and tell people who don't. Proclaim the message of Jesus to those who are every Sunday churchgoers and to people who barely walk through the doors of a church. Tell it to people who have maybe given up on church because they got burned in the past and and those who, who are super connected to church. He says, tell them. Go to Republicans and Democrats and people who could care less about politics. Go to Muslims and Hindus and atheists and tell them about Jesus. Go to married people and single people, straight people and gay people. Tell them. They need to know about Jesus. Go to white people. Go to black people. Go to people who are some shade in between, whether they're from your cultural background or not. Jesus says, I want you to go because they need to hear this good news too. Go to your cousin, go to your brother, go to your husband, go to your wife, go to your kids, go to your golfing buddies. Whoever it is that God has put in your world, he says, share the gospel with. Because they need to know this truth too. You know, I think one of the struggles we have, at least I do, when it comes to sharing Jesus with others, is sometimes we get this this faulty mentality that those people will never believe. You ever do that? Those people, that individual, that group, they're they're just never going to believe, so why even go to them? If you've ever thought like that, as I have, Jesus says, stop. Jesus says, get it out of your head right now because that is garbage, right? And and then Jesus gives us example after example after example, right? Have you heard of a guy named Paul? Paul wrote half the New Testament. If somebody were playing a word association game with me and said, the Apostle Paul, and you say, greatest missionary ever, 
right? He planted more churches than anybody we know of in Scripture. He, he told so many people about Jesus. Someday you're going to be in heaven, and you're going to meet a ton of people that are going to be like, you know how I heard about Jesus? I'm here because Paul told us. But did you know that Paul used to go by Saul? And he was not a nice guy. He was the enemy of the Christian church, that early Christian church. And he was responsible for ripping families apart, putting husbands in jails, and, and even killing them all because they believed in Jesus. And I would guess that, that when the Christian church got together in some sort of leadership meeting and talked about evangelism, nobody said, let's go to Paul and tell him about Jesus so he can come to our church, guaranteed. In fact, eventually when a man named Ammonanias, a Christian, went to Paul, imagine being that guy, right? Paul is still Saul. He, he was coming to your hometown to throw people like you in jail, and God says, you've got to go talk to him, and you're going to baptize him. Really? But he goes. I'm sure he was scared. I'd be if I was Ananias. But he went and he told Paul about Jesus and Paul was baptized and God brought him to faith and he became one of the greatest missionaries ever. Or I think of Jonah. You know the story of Jonah, right? Most of us think Jonah the big fish. That's like itty bitty part of the story. That's really not even the point of the story. But Jonah was God's prophet. He was from Israel. He knew the true God. And one day God said, Jonah, you need to go somewhere for me. Okay, God, where am I going? Am I going to Jericho? Am I going to Bethlehem? Am I going to a suburb of Jerusalem? Like Bethany's cool this time of year, God, right? Am I, I'm staying home, right? Where am I going? He says, you're going to Nineveh. Nineveh? <laughs> you heard me, Jonah, Nineveh. You mean the Nineveh in Assyria? Yeah, that Nineveh. You mean the Nineveh that is our arch enemy, that, that have, we've already fought in battles and they've, they've killed our soldiers and they've, they've pillaged our land at times? You mean that Nineveh? Yeah, Jonah, now you're tracking. You got it. That Nineveh. Why would we want to go to those people, God? They're not going to repent. They're horrible. They're nasty. And God says, no, I want you to go. There's over 100,000 people in that city who don't know me, and I want you to go and preach a message of repentance and forgiveness in my name. Go. And Jonah didn't want to go. In fact, even how the story ends, the whole book ends, Jonah's still pretty angry and bitter, but you know what did happen? Jonah went, and he did what God said, and he preached a message of repentance, and the whole town repents. Did you know that? Nineveh, bloodthirsty, arch enemy, could care less about God. Nineveh was actually more of the Christian than God's own Jonah. They repented. They, they turned to God for forgiveness. And then Jesus even talks about them. This is amazing, right? Jesus even talks about them in, in the Gospels. And he says, you know what's going to happen on the last day because you're rejecting me? The people of Nineveh are going to rise up and judge you because they repented and they believed the good news. Nineveh. Those people, they'll never repent. God caused over 100,000 of them to repent, and you're going to see them in heaven someday. So go. Or maybe you have a story like that. Maybe, maybe it was that family member that, that said, you know what, we'll come back to church when hell freezes over, and hell's a cold place now because they're coming to church regularly, and they're hearing about Jesus. Maybe it was that friend that you've been working on for years and, and, and you never thought anything would happen. You, you didn't think he made a difference. But now they know Jesus and they can't remember a day without knowing him. Because God used you to share it with them. Maybe it's you. Maybe at one point people wrote you off. No way he's ever going to listen. No way she's ever going to come. No way. Nope, not happening. And yet, God worked forgiveness and life in your heart. And let's be honest, at one point, wasn't that all of us? The Bible says at one point, all of us were lost in sin. All of us were dead. All of us had a one-way ticket to hell. And God made sure that somebody told you. Right? He made sure that somebody 
listen to the command to go and share, and, and they share Jesus with you, and now you know Jesus. You know that he loves you. You know that he forgives you. Yes, even for those sins. Because he paid for them on his cross. You know that, that even when you have failed, Jesus didn't. When you've been faithless, Jesus was faithful to you. When, when others wrote you off, Jesus never wrote you off. And the times that we are tempted to write others off, Jesus forgives us for that. He, he directs our attention back to him, and then he says, I still want you to be my ambassador, so go. Share Jesus. Remember, Carl? One day, I saw Carl walking through the parking lot not too long ago. And that was one of the days where he kind of stopped and, and just stared through my window, smiling and waving at me. <laughs> and, and he caught my attention, and I waved back. And, and for some reason, maybe that day was different, and God gave me a kick in the butt, and I went out to the parking lot. And we talked. It was small talk. How you doing? I'm fine. Oh, this weather's kind of cold. I even offered, like, it's cold. Can I take you to Food Line and back? No, Pastor, I'm good. And so we went back and forth for a few minutes. And I invited him to church, as I'd done before. But then I said, Carl, do you know that Jesus loves you? Do you know that, that he died for you, that, that he loves you so much that he died for you and he wants you in heaven forever with you? I don't know if Carl will ever walk through those doors. But you know what I know now? I know that Carl, he heard about Jesus. I know that now Carl has heard that he has a God who loves him and wants to save him, not condemn him. Wants to wash him of sins and bring him home to heaven, not, not to kick him out. Carl knows that. And I pray I get many more opportunities to tell him. Friends, go. Go and tell somebody. Share the good news of Jesus. Because they're not going to magically know. And don't assume they know. Tell them anyway, even if they do. Tell them they got a God who loves them. they got a Savior who died for them. And that someday they're going to be in heaven because of Jesus. And that's God's desire that they know and live with him forever. Go and tell. Because as Jesus reminds us today, whoever, and I mean whoever believes in Jesus will be saved. Amen. As we get an opportunity to continue to think about sharing Jesus with others, one of the ways we share Jesus is through corporately as, as a church. And so as you think about your offerings, as you think about how God has blessed you, um, um, think about maybe making uh, an offering. Because it doesn't just go to keep the lights on, it goes so that we as a church can continue to share Jesus. Um, if, if you're watching online, click on that link to give online. You can do that in person um, either way. But but. This allows us to continue to share Jesus with as many people as possible and, and reach people that, that we never even thought about reaching. Um, also, as you think about that, if you could fill out that connection card, that goes a long way in helping us uh, better serve you with the good news of Jesus.
please stand for prayer. Father, there are so many things that, that we could thank you for and, and praise you for. But most importantly this morning, we want to thank you for your grace. That amazing, undeserved love that moved you to send your son to take our place. To die the death that we deserved, all so that our sins would be forgiven and paid for and that we would be set free to be people of God forever. Father, that is the greatest love of all. And we thank you on this Valentine's Day for that kind of love. Father, we also thank you for, for the love you've given us in our marriages, with our kids, our spouses, our family, our friends, our, our church family. We all too often take that kind of love for granted in those relationships. On a day like today, help us to remember those things. Help us to, to praise and thank you for them. And also let those individuals know that, that we love them too. Father, this morning, as we think about your love, we think about our brother Jason Fromke and his whole family. Today, their, their hearts are filled with sorrow. Today, they're struggling. Today, they're mourning the loss of Jason's mom, Rose, who died this past week. Father, in your amazing, infinite love, comfort them with the certain hope of that love that sent Jesus for Rose. We rejoice in the fact that she was a baptized, blood-bought child of God, and on this day, she is resting securely in her Savior's arms. But the rest of the family is still here. And they're here in a world that is broken and hurting and dying and crying and suffering, so we ask that you help them. Direct their eyes to you. Remind them of your love, not only for Rose and what you did for her, but what you have done for them. Give them a peace and a joy and a confidence that only you can. And sustain them during this difficult time. And Father, use us as, as their brothers and sisters to help them, to reach out to them, to comfort them, not just with thoughts and prayers and condolences, because those are just mere empty words, but actually tell them it's going to be okay because of Jesus. It, it's going to work out because of Christ and his suffering and death. It's going to be okay because you've got a God who says, I'll never leave you or forsake you, not even as you walk through the valley of the shadow of death. So use your people to do that, Lord, to actually share the truth of you. And not just with the Fromke family, but let us go from here and continue to share that truth with others. Forgive us for when we've failed. Forgive us for when we've kept our mouth shut out of fear or apathy or laziness. And reassure us that we're forgiven for those sins and recommit us to the fight at hand so that we can share you with many more. Father, we ask you to now hear us as we bring you our own prayers this morning. Father, hear us as we pray that prayer that your Son, our Savior, once taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Lord God, Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation, and bestow on us your saving grace. 
We ask all of this through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go now in peace. Live in harmony with one another and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated. We close with our, our final song. It's called Make Me a Light, a great song reminding us how, how Jesus uses us. He lived, he died for us, and now he says be salt and be light in this dying world as you share Jesus with others. Good to see you all. Good to have you guys joining us online, wherever you're watching today. A um, couple of quick things. Um, lots going on in the next week or two, so I, I just want to point them out to you. Um, first of all, this morning, no Sunday school, no Bible class, no confirmation. It's been kind of in the plans for a couple of months now. And one of the big deals is uh, we, we love our volunteers, and we have volunteers who do an awful lot for this church. And this is an opportunity, especially with the Sunday school staff, uh, to give them a little breather. A week off to just recharge and relax and get ready to come back next week. So that's what's going on today. That's why there's no Sunday school or Bible class. Um, this week, we're having Ash Wednesday. 40 days of Lent. Um, the, the church, for, for quite a number of years now, has celebrated this 
um, journey to the cross. Lent's a great time to remember what Jesus endured for us, right? He endured suffering, beatings, and yes, even death on the cross because of my sins and yours. Yet through it, he saves us. So it's a good time to reflect, to repent, uh, and to rejoice in what Jesus has done. So we're going to kick that off this Wednesday, 6.30, a special service here uh, um, for Ash Wednesday. And then, as I mentioned last week, then as we go through Lent, every other week is going to be one of those life groups. Next Sunday, we are going to have the sign-ups ready, um, and, and we're going to get you plugged in. We're going to tell you how, how you can do that and any help you might need that's coming. And all of those life groups throughout the week will definitely be Lenten-based, right? So even though we're not maybe meeting in person every week, um, we're going to be in God's Word every week with a message that's Lenten-based. Because another thing um, that I talked about too, and we're going to start it up on Thursday, is the Bible reading plan. We got a Bible reading plan, Mark. We're going through the Gospel of Mark. And if you know anything about Mark, it's, it's kind of condensed. It's the shortest on the Gospels. And Mark is speaking to kind of a Jewish audience, but, but he's going really fast, right? He, the major events in Jesus' life, this is his mission. He came to suffer and die to save us. So, that 30-day Bible reading plan, I'm super excited. It's going to start on Thursday, and then it's going to go Monday through Fridays of Lent. And there's a couple ways you can do this. You can, you can go to our website and download, um, or, or you don't even have to download. Just go to the website, and all the days are laid out in the readings. You can get a buddy and do it. You can join our Facebook group, which the benefit of that is you can comment. You can ask questions. You can kind of engage with one another. And the last time we did it, we had over 90, which was awesome. And a lot of great discussion was, was had and questions, so people were growing in their faith. So a couple different ways to do it. Um, and again, you don't even have to do those, but, but find one. Uh, we're trying to give you options here as a church, different ways to get into God's Word regularly through this, through this awesome season. Um, maybe just two other things. Uh, next week, we're starting a new sermon series called Endured. And we're gonna, each week, we're going to look at everything Jesus did for us. All right? I, I just said that's kind of what we're doing in Lent. And, and next week, we're going to start out um, how Jesus endured temptation for us, right? If you remember the battle in the des desert, in the wilderness with the devil, um, he underwent temptation just like us and defeated it to save us. So that's what our sermon series is going to be about. I'm kind of excited. And, um, and one more thing, the food drive. We, uh, the leadership and I, we had talked about this. We had done something back in Christmas to help out in our community with, with needy families. Um, we want to do this again. So starting next week, so the 21st through April 4th, which is Easter Sunday, bring in your canned goods. We're, we're going to do this for the CHEW program. That's children eating healthy. No, children healthy eating on weekends. CHEW. There we go. Um, Shelly's awesome. We've worked with her before. We've been to the CHEW house. I know like Dave was with me. I don't know who else. Joe was. We, we cleaned up there, but really great partnership we have with her. Um, they need soup really, really bad right now. And so we want to make it easy on you. We're just doing soup. So bring in your cans of soup. Um, if you want to give a financial donation, and, and we can give that too, that's okay as well. But soup or a financial donation. And then at the end, um, if we reach a certain goal, something kind of fun is going to happen. That's all I'm going to tell you today. I'm not going to go, go any further. Uh, but something cool is going to happen. Some of the leadership knows, so don't tell anybody leadership. You know what's going to happen. Um, but it's going to be kind of, we want to make it fun. But we want to encourage you to do that. It's a way to give back to our community. Um, finally, last but not least, a uh, thank you to our musicians, our worship coordinator, the tech guys back there, uh, people that make the online thing happen. All of you guys, thank you so much for beautifying our worship today and, and making it what it is. So appreciate you guys. So, yeah, we can clap. And we're glad to hear that some of the folks that were out are, are healthy and happy again. So we're really, we're really thankful to God for that as well. Um, so, again, thanks for being here. Thanks for tuning in online. Whatever you do today, remember Jesus loves you. And go and tell somebody that. Have a good day.